I went to college, got an engineering degree, worked at Boeing for a few years. I had like very secure, high paying jobs. And then after five years of that, I decided that I just needed to do something else. So I quit and I didn't really have any plan about what I was going to do. Real estate isn't always easy, but it will get you where you need to go. And it will call on the best of you if you let it, or it will push you away and make you feel like a big fat loser, which is done to me at different, different times. And you can come back. So real estate is a powerful field to be in, but it will question your capacity to stick with it and help you grow your mindset and your grit. There's two things that fundamentally motivate people, right? There's pain and pleasure. Fear of pain is a much stronger motivator. And the pain in that case was going back to that miserable existence that I just refused to do. And that was so much more important to me than, you know, honestly being successful. You know, first house took us four months to flip and we made $4,000. Um, okay. <laughs> so it was a really low return on our time. But the second one we flipped, we learned a bunch of lessons and yeah. uh, we made about 40 grand on that. And so we launched our first market, which was uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. Started mm. making some really good money down there. And then uh, that worked really well. And then so we started standing up other markets. And now basically what we do is instead of trying to be like the top person in every market, we try to be like, I would say like a middle tier player in every market. And so what that does, instead of like scaling up our marketing super high, like 30, $40,000 yep. a month in one market, we basically spread it. So we're doing like five to $10,000 in every market. And so we're doing, you know, one to three deals a month per market. But what that allows us to do is have more longevity in this business and avoid the cash flow problems that you were alluding to before. I am Christina Suter, and this is the Real Estate Breakthrough Show, where we talk about the reality of real estate, the mindset you need in order to face the reality of what it is, and tips and tricks to get you moving forward in investing. I am your host, Christina Suter. Hey you, this is Christina Suter on Real Estate Breakthrough, and I have Mike DeHaan with me. He's been coaching me on how to say his name correctly, so I think I said that right. Yeah. Um, he has a national flipping and wholesaling business, which he's going to tell us more about, and just as exciting is he is the host of Collecting Keys podcast, which honestly has, I think, more episodes than I do. Now, I've had two podcasts. I've had my real estate podcast. I've had my small business podcast. I had 500 episodes of my small business podcast before I started my real estate one. Honestly, I think you're pretty close. <laughs> I think yeah. you've got a lot of episodes out there. And part of why I invited Mike to my show was because I could the, his podcast and the way they position it is that it really is about talking about the truth of what it means to invest in real estate. And you know, guys, I'm passionate about being willing to accept that investing in real estate isn't always easy, but it will get you where you need to go, but it will grow you up. It will challenge you, it will grow you up, and it will call on the best of you if you let it, or it will push you away and make you feel like a big fat loser, which is done to me at different, different times. And you can, you come back. So real estate is a powerful field to be in, but it will question your capacity to stick with it and help you grow your mindset and your grit. So Mike, welcome to the show. Why don't you bottom line some of your history so that people can really get a sense for why you're an expert in the field and that you actually been doing this for a while. Yeah, I've, I've been doing it for about six years, um, real estate. And so I, uh, you know, didn't start with that, obviously, like I'm young ish, I guess I'm, I'm in my early thirties. Um, but, uh, you know, when I got into real estate, it was kind of my backup plan after going through what everyone else that was born in the nineties did. Right. So I was, you know, millennial, I grew up, went to college. That was sort of the expectation for everybody. Um, and you know, when I was coming up through high school, if you didn't go to college, basically you were like a loser, right? Like I even look back and, and th things like trade schools and stuff weren't even an option. Like I remember a kid in my high school class getting made fun of because his dad was a plumber, right? Which is just such a hilarious thing to think about now because like now everyone's trying to get into trades, right? Um, and so well, I- and, uh, and plumbers are actually not necessarily slouches if you look at how no. much a, a truly seasoned licensed plumber can make. I mean, given that we pay them, right? We, we can yeah, get for sure. like a really good plumber. I know a plumber who specializes in doing public properties like like schools. Mm -hmm. And he, he hauls in on a single job a half a million dollars. Oh yeah. Some of the commercial stuff is crazy that those guys yeah. do. But, All right. Go ahead. Um, I interrupted you. Mike. Yeah. No, no, you're good. So went to college. Um, yeah. Went to college. Um, got a, got an engineering degree. Um, I went to college here in, in Spokane, Washington, where I live at, at Gonzaga. Um, and you know, struggled through school mostly because I didn't really want to be there. Like I was a good student growing up, but, 
Um, I did engineering purely just because when I entered college, it was 2009 um, and you know the recession had kind of just gone on, right? And so I uh, wanted to do something that was gonna be employable when I graduated. And by all the research I had done, that was engineering. And so I went down that path. And the thought process I had was that when I graduated, I was gonna have a high paying job that was secure. And that's where I was gonna get to learn to be happy, right? Cause uh -huh. I was gonna have money, yeah. I was gonna have some freedom. Yes, and I know the story, the, yep. the traditional American dream, which mm -hmm. I have many commentaries on, but I will let you continue. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. Ahead. So I, uh, you know, worked as an engineer for five years. Um, okay. I, I worked out in the Seattle area. I worked at Boeing for a few years. I had like very secure, high paying jobs. And then um, after five years of that, I decided that I just needed to do something else. So I quit um, and I didn't really have any plan about what I was going to do. Um, I was, I was married at the time and, um, I I'll always remember when I made the decision to quit cause I'd been unhappy for a while and I was, it was one of those days. It was actually right before my birthday and, uh, I was, I was driving to work and it's one of those, one of those days where I was three quarters of the way to work. I didn't have the radio on, you know, and it was like still yeah. silent in my car and I was just in like a, you know, bad mental place. And I called my wife and I was like, I think I need to quit my job. And she yeah. was like, what, what are you going to do? And I said, I have no idea. And she said, well, are you going to be happier? And I said, probably. And she was like, okay, well, I guess you should do what you had to do. And so <laughs> I, I wow. went Wow, okay, good yeah. choice on whoever you married. I don't know her, but I respect her already. Yeah, it's the, the benefit of being a high school sweetheart. We'd already gone through a lot of stuff together. So Yeah, that um, is good. I mean, if her focus is about wanting you to be happy, there's so much in that conversation to unpack by itself mm -hmm. of what it means to choose to be happy so that you're a better father, a better husband, a better partner, a better part of your community. Mm -hmm. I mean, it affects everything you touch. It really does. You know, and you don't even realize that, I would say, until you, I don't know, experience that shift, mm -hmm. right? Like there's, there's so much talk around like mental health issues and things. Um, and I would say the people that don't have that, they don't seem to understand the people that do. Right. And like, right. and almost like vice versa, the people that do have mental health issues, they don't understand what other people don't. Yeah. Um, and it creates this weird divide. And, you know, I, I'd, I'd been in the state of depression for years, like, like literally the year, uh, 2016, which is the year that I got married. I had some family stuff that happened. I don't even know anything that happened that entire year. I was at Boeing and I was super miserable and I literally couldn't tell you a single thing that happened in my life. That, that year is just like gone from my memory. Yeah. Um, and so when I, when I quit, like so when I was me, my wife and I had that conversation, I literally went in from that drive and I quit that day, um, okay. you know, put in my two weeks and decided that I was going to do something else. And I didn't know what that was. And so I, uh, I left that job and you know, it was, it was hard. Like my, my wife and I, we lost like over 75% of our income. Um, yeah. she, she worked as a, as an artist and, and made a little bit of money. Um, we had had some savings and stuff cause we always lived below our means. And I was really into, I would say like the financial independence movement before that, but doing it the opposite direction where instead of like making a lot of money and like building just a business, money. just yeah. saving money and like living super lean. So we had a good reserve, but I mean, I, I, I remember the first day that I woke up when I wasn't going to have to go to my engineering job. And it was such a weird feeling because I felt like so like light, even though there was so much uncertainty, like I never felt like so certain that I'd made the right decision. You know? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, yes. and, and it, I mean, it's huge that mm -hmm. again, a poignant moment that I want to highlight because people will hesitate moving into something. They will hesitate moving into the devil I know is better than the devil I don't know. Totally. And yet what you've described is so important, which is, you know, you're on purpose when you wake up and you go, I have no freaking idea. But what I do know is that I've made this right decision. And I'm standing mm -hmm. in the right place. Exactly. And, and my backup plan was always that I could just go back to doing engineering. I still had the degree. And yeah. so my like worst case scenario was what I was already going to have been doing anyway. Right. And, uh, and yeah, so, you know, we, we went from kind of being able to do whatever we wanted to, um, you know, having to, you know, clip coupons, do all that sort of stuff, but that was fine. Um, we were on board with that. And, you know, what I did is I spent the next few months kind of just trying to figure out what I was going to do. So I worked in a gym. Um, I coached, uh, like CrossFit classes, um, you know, several times a day, um, you know, for $20 a class. And then I would drive for Uber, um, and I would make a little bit of money there and I would do like weird 
odd job stuff on Facebook. Like, you know, someone would say like, hey, I like I need some like teenagers to come and plant a tree. And I'd be like, well, I'm like almost 30, but I'll come plant a tree I for you. I don't care <laughs> for a hundred, hundred bucks. You know, I need the money. Um, and that's what I did for, nice. for years. Um, and, and in that, in that period of time, I started getting into real estate mostly because it was in every single like business and wealth building book that I was reading and every podcast that I was consuming. So like real estate hadn't even really been on my radar as an investment. I owned a house. Um, but, uh, yeah, like the, the real estate investing piece came around just because it seemed to be the most recurring and consistent model that I could find to build wealth and to make what I want at that time was passive income through cash flow. Right. And, uh, and so I decided to go, you know, all in on that. Um, when I first did it, I didn't really have a lot of money, so I would just go to meetups and that's how I started making connections and learning about real estate. And, uh, I got into flipping houses mostly because I recognized that if I wanted to acquire long-term assets, I was going to need more capital. And so I flipped, um, a couple of houses to start. I, I met this local couple uh, at a meetup that they had more money than time and I had more time than money. And nice. We were nice. both honestly green to real estate. We just had different positions that we were coming from. Yeah. And, and yeah, exactly. And so, so we decided we we're going to flip houses together and just split stuff 50, 50. And, uh, you know, I was going to manage the project and, you know, do some of the, the work. Um, and I'd literally never done any like labor or house, you know, repairs or anything like that before. And so, you know, me and my wife are there like watching YouTube videos about like how to like lay flooring, like how to like hang drywall. And we're just doing that piece of it to save some money on the renovation, you know? And okay. yeah, you know, and we hired out like all the technical stuff, plumbing and those sort of things. Like the, plumbing the general, and like yeah. The general plumbing. labor, we, we did all that. Um, and, uh, you know, first house took us four months to flip and we made $4,000. Um, okay. <laughs> so it was a really low our return on our time. Yes. But the second one we flipped, we learned a bunch of lessons and, yeah. uh, we made about 40 grand on that. So um, what was the decision that kept you with it? I mean, you just described that the first house, I love the grit. Like, let's just start with, I love the grit, yeah. like driving for Uber, planting a tree, picking up odd jobs, doing what you can. And then, but in the background that whole time. Like, let's be clear, you didn't just go, oh yeah, forget it. You went, I'm reading books, I'm understanding what I can do, I'm I'm educating myself on wealth. Yeah. I'm educating myself on what else can I do. And so it wasn't like you gave up on your purpose or your direction, you were just earning what you need to earn mm -hmm. in order to get to where you needed to go. But you probably didn't know yet, well, where, 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 where am I going? Where am I going? But you didn't let that stop you. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a really hard time to be in for people to not yeah. have a direct path, to not go, this is where I'm going to not go. This is my purpose. I'm really clear. Even for me, I'm like, I don't want to hope that I'm like, oh crap, what am I going to do? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Even for me, that's a hard space to sit in, but you were willing to dig in and support yourself in doing it. But then once you did that first flip and you're in $4,000, why didn't you turn away from real estate and go, oh, this didn't work? Well, I'd, I'd already bought the second one. I didn't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, all right. So no big profound answer. Just I was stuck. And yeah. So I ended up rolling forward. Yeah. I mean, I mean and, and here's the thing too is, you know, we only made $4,000, but there was a lot of, I would say, opportunities that we recognized that we could have done better. Okay. Right. Just like little things. So, so like, for example, like when we were running comps on the house, we didn't just ignorance. We didn't even notice that our house was the only one on the street that didn't have a garage. So of course it's going to sell for less than all the other ones that do have a garage. Okay. Right. And so that, that right there knocked like 15 grand off of our sales price. Yeah. Okay. And if that situation had been different and we had recognized that we would have offered differently on the house, right. you know, or, or the, the other, one of the other big things that we um, got into, and this was fully so just self-inflicted. We bought the house. Um, it was like in the winter. It was starting to get cold. It was the end of 2018. We already had a frost. The house was an REO. It had been abandoned for two years. And so we turned on the water. And of course, what happened? All the pipes burst. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so we had to spend like $25,000 repiping the entire house and fi yeah. fixing all the water damage that we hadn't accounted for. If that hadn't happened, we would have made that additional 25 grand. Yeah. Right. And so those two things alone were our, our profit that we were expecting to make. 
okay. um, when we'd done things. And so we were able to take that instead of being like, oh, well, this sucks. It's like, well, let's just not do that same thing next time. And so we did it. Right. So you next one had a garage. Next, actually, the next one did not have a garage, but the, com <laughs> the, the comps didn't require it to. So it worked out. Okay. 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 That's good. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Well, so you were already into that second house, but then you went, you're not just flip. I mean, it's amazing. That you just walked into flipping first and not wholesaling. Mm -hmm. But now tell me more about what you're doing today. Like, where did that take you and why do you continue to stay with it? Like, it's not easy to be a national flipper and wholesaler. That's multiple markets that you're managing either teams or you're working really hard, dude. Yeah. Like, you can't yeah. do that without a lot of help. Yeah. So. I mean, obviously a lot of stuff went in the middle. Um, and so the reason well, I got into- Tell me yeah. about any stuff in the middle you wanna tell me about. Sure, so so the the main main reason I got into wholesaling, um, honestly, I bought a, a property that um, we were playing to flip, I think this was the fourth one. And I paid the wholesaler a $37,000 assignment fee. And the deal was still fine. Um, but I remember looking at that number on the HUD statement, I was like, that's kind of like a lot. Like, I feel like we should be getting that. And then I met the wholesaler in person and I was like, this guy isn't, I don't know, any smarter than I am. Like, right. I feel like I could do what he's doing. Yeah. And so um, I decided that's what I was gonna do. Um, and the, the current partnership that I had with that couple, they didn't really have an interest. So we kind of like wrapped up our projects and parted ways. But I partnered up with my best friend from college who had been wanting, he'd, he'd bought a couple of rental properties. He had a very high income job and he wanted to build a real estate business. And he's still my business partner today. And we decided we were going to go direct to seller purely with the objective being to buy, build a portfolio. Like our goal was never to, to wholesale. And so when we started, we, we were going to mark for these deals. Um, we were going to like flip some houses to make some money. And then we were going to roll it into a, a larger portfolio. Mm -hmm. And so we started marketing for, for deals. Um, and this will be, be another good one for about like overcoming the initial challenge because we started, we started doing this marketing sure. in January yeah. of 2020. Um, okay. right. And so things obviously went sideways <laughs> in March, right? COVID yeah. happened. Yep. Um, COVID. we started having some challenges there and we, it took us until May to get our first deal. At that point, we were $30,000 in the hole of right. like just spending on marketing and systems. And we didn't okay. know when our deal was going to come from. Um, and, and it generally takes six months to get a wholesaling business brand, mm -hmm. right? Brand identity so that you have a steady flow in and you have buyers out. Yeah. Right? It usually yeah. takes six months to get your first deal. And it's true as a real estate agent too. It's the same mm -hmm. six months. Yeah. Right. And we, we didn't even know that, right? We were just going in, especially because we started getting leads and stuff relatively quickly. We didn't know how to run a sales process. And right. so we were spending all this money. Um, we got our first deal closed. We made a $7,500 um, assignment check and we wholesaled that deal purely because we had kind of spent all of our money, right? <laughs> like, like we were planning to like flip these things, but then we got that, that faster cash and we were like, okay, I understand how this process works. And so we closed a couple more deals over the next few months. Um, and then in October of that year, we had our first six figure month. Um, and that's when stuff really started to click. And okay. at, yeah, at that point, and that, we had, you said that took you six months to get to your first six figure month. And it took us about five months to get our first deal. Okay. Um, so we, clo we closed that in, I guess we said we, cl we signed it in May, closed it in June. It's about six months to get paid. And okay. then in October of that year, um, we had our first six figure month and made $108,000. So how did you maintain yourself? Obviously spending cash, pushing, pushing cash out, losing mm -hmm. money, appearing to lose money while you're developing yeah. a brand, which people don't really always appreciate how, what it takes to develop a brand, whether it's a wholesaling or whether you're a syndicator or, you know, it's a, let me tell you, there's a lot of money that goes into keeping, oh, yeah. maintaining a brand. <laughs> like it's yeah. just kind of, to me, it's almost scary. So how do you guys manage to know that you were still very much on the right path and what team members or what supports did you get to move yourself forward? I didn't like, that's the thing, right? Is like, I just, all I knew was that I was not going to go back to what I was doing before. Um, right. Pure and, determination of I'm walking away from the pain and towards something that just that, that morning of waking up after you quit your job and go, I don't know what's ahead of me, but it's better than my worst plan, which is to go back to where I was. Exactly. And even though it had been years at that point, right? Like that was just not an option I was willing to consider. Um, you know, and there's, there's two things that fundamentally motivate people, right? There's pain and pleasure. 
That's and right. the That's fear of the fear, yeah, the fear of pain is a much stronger motivator. And the pain in that case was going back to that miserable existence that I just refused to do. And that was so much more important to me than, you know, honestly being successful. Like, like if I was able to scrape by yeah. and just like, you know, I don't figure out the most basic level of success, but not have to go back to that, then I was going to be happy. Um, That's perfectly said. So let me ask about the next step, which is, we know you used the avoidance of pain to scrape by, to build a basis, to start building a foundation. Mm -hmm. But now you got a foundation built. It still takes grit, and at least it does for me. Maybe it didn't for you, but for me, it still takes a sense of grit and determination and choice to go, okay, I'm good here, but let me go there. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing well regionally, you had to push yourself further mm -hmm. to yeah. get to where you are today. Yeah, and you know this is something that that we talk about a decent amount on our show too, because I, I think it's there's this phenomenon that people go through when they find a level of financial success that I would call like tier two financial independence, where you're not just like paying your bills, you can kind of like do whatever you want. Like yeah. honestly, tier, can, tier one is like, oh man, I, I've replaced my bills, but I can't stop doing what I'm doing. I need to, I need to, I can keep building. Then there's tier two, and I have you know I have many clients that mm -hmm. are in tier two or. I know the experience of tier two because there is this sort of like, okay. And there's almost like the subconscious and the fear, which has been right, the avoidance of pain that's been driving you starts to just disappear. And mm -hmm. you just kind of go, I'm kind of okay, actually. Like if I keep <laughs> doing this, it doesn't hurt too much to do it. I can kind of buy most of what I want. Regionally, most of us can achieve that at a regional level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and then, you know, when you get to that p point, you know, you can go and play golf on a Tuesday, you can buy the house, in the neighborhood that you want, you can go, you know, take your family to Europe for a few weeks. And like, you know, it costs money, but you're not like stressed about it. And when people reach that, and they know how to maintain that is when you learn what you actually want with like your life, because, you know, the, the, the whole concept of like the hierarchy of needs, once you, all of your needs are, are met and you're at the very top of the pyramid, which is, you know, self-fulfillment or self-value, yep. that is, you know, that's, that's why you hear like a lot of these like big influencers out there. They're talking about like their perfect morning routines and how they spend all this time journaling and doing all sorts of stuff. It's because they are trying to contemplate what they actually want with their lives. It's not, it's not what made them successful. They have the ability to do that now because they are trying to figure out what they're actually supposed to do now that they're already rich. Okay. And, and so for us, when we reach like that, that point, yeah, I like we, that a lot. It's, yeah. it's true. It's, it I, true. I teach my team all the time, mm -hmm. pray, ground, meditate, do that every morning, spend a minimum of 30 minutes doing it. Right. It's like doing your bicep curls. You go to the gym, you get your bicep curls, you know, you don't question why you're doing your bicep curls. Bicep curls aren't any fun. You're not having a good time while you're doing it. Maybe it feels kind of like, ah, yeah, feel the pain, love the bird. Right? Meditating is the same way. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Feel the pain, love the burn, love that you're completely distracted. Because yeah. what you want is the strength that comes out of it that lets you live a better life, a more superior day, having a better mindset, be more able to take on problems, be more of a solution finder instead of you know dropping back into feeling victim -y or feeling mm -hmm. like you're overwhelmed. That's the purpose of that perfect morning. Yeah. Right? But it's really what you just said. I really want to highlight it because it's not necessarily how you got there. Mm -hmm. How you got to level two was I'm avoiding the pain that's back here. I'm working my ass off. I'm pushing every day because I want to get away from where I was and I'm choosing to direct myself and I'm working probably really long hours mm -hmm. getting stuff done that actually feels truthfully kind of painful. Like yeah. learning how to do drywall, learning how, <laughs> learning how to, you know, Thank goodness you weren't doing plumbing, but you know, fixing the plumbing problem and going, man, I just totally hosed this whole job, but I'm not going back. I'm going to go forward and I'm mm -hmm. going to stay committed to what I know is a greater freedom for me. Mm -hmm. That's the avoiding of the pain heading to freedom. Exactly. Right. Yeah. But I love that you say it's not the, it's not the minds, the, the affirmations and the meditations that get you there. That shows up when the financial space shows up. Yeah, once you have the security, right? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, when, when people reach that, they they find out what their real motivator is if they want to just kind of hang out there and live their life and do their thing. And that's cool. I would say most people tend to fall into that. Um, and then there's a, a smaller section of people that decide like, well, I want to do something bigger and see 
you know, how successful I can get or, or do the biggest thing that I can. And I tend to lean more on, on that end of it. Right. And so, you know, when, when we were, um, doing, when we scaled our business here locally, I was, I personally made seven figures, um, you know, in, in the, that one year that we scaled up there and we could have done it again in future years, but we decided to go larger, um, because we're like, why not? You know, mm -hmm. and and for me, just I think constantly being a competitive person growing up to I would say just like say like that's like good enough, I guess like that wasn't really an option. Like I've always been somebody that's trying to stretch myself to the limits, whether that's through, you know, sports or, you know, like in school or in different things. And uh, business has been my way to just, I would say, harness that same sort of motivation. And mm -hmm. so we started this national business um, in early 2022. Um, and we, our th sort of thesis with it is it, we just take the same model that we do where we're running direct mail and we have a cold calling team and we have a sales team and we just copy and paste it in a different market and how okay. different can it be? And it turns out it's actually really similar, right? right? And so we launched our first market, which was uh, first virtual market, market, which was Knoxville, Tennessee, mm. started making some really good money down there. I know, um, cool. Yeah, and then uh, that worked really well. And then so we started standing up other markets. Um, and now basically what we do is instead of trying to be like the top person in every market, we try to be like, I would say like a middle tier player in every market. And so what that does, instead of like scaling up our marketing super high, like 30, 40,000 dollars yep. a month in one market, we basically spread it. So we're doing like five to $10,000 in every market. Mm -hmm. And so we're doing, you know, one to three deals a month per market. But what that allows us to do is have more longevity in this business and avoid the cash flow problems that you were alluding to before. Yeah. Because when one market gets weird because it's winter, because mm -hmm. there's some political turmoil, because there's yeah. a storm, because yeah. there's whatever, the other markets are still going along. And so it allows us to have this more consistency with the transactional real estate business, which is really hard to do. I think that's a really important distinction because ambition would want to drive one to be the best mm -hmm. be the best then you say well what's actually my goal so mm -hmm. is my goal to be the best and recognize as the best or is my goal to have a functioning business that is maintainable across eons mm -hmm. or markets multiple markets multiple regions and it, it 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 is a hard question i think for people to answer because you look at the Ken McElroy's or the Rod Khalifs or Robert Cardone, the one who, you know, who's got a lot of flash about him, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, wow, they're, you know, they're the best. I want to be the best like them. And it's like, well, really? Is that what you, is that, that may be what you want some moments of your day. Mm -hmm. But then what do you really want when you're going to sleep at night so that you fall asleep well? What yeah. do you really want so that you wake up peaceful and go, yeah, I can take this day on. I can take it on. I can take it on. I can do it again and I can do it again. Like mm -hmm. I'm a horrible flipper. Truth is, I'm a horrible flipper. I have flipped twice in my career. I flipped back in 2002, three and four, back when like flipping was like you buy something and you wait mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was worth more money. Yeah. I wasn't really that good at it or that smart at it, truth be told, but I was making money. I made 25% or more on every deal I bought. Well, mm -hmm. the market went up by 20% on every deal I bought, right? Yeah. And then I went back to it in 2015, 2016, 2017. And then I got stuck with a couple projects. I lost my project manager that I had to finish. And I went, you know, I don't like the process of flipping, mm -hmm. right? Chunk money or not. I don't like the process of flipping. I find it exhausting in comparison yep. to my consulting work, my teaching, my engagement with my properties, owning direct ownership, doing syndication, you know, investing in syndication deals, the portfolio I had created around me that allowed me my financial freedom and my stability as a mom, as a as the primary bread earner in my family. I'm like, this is not how I want to earn my money. Mm -hmm. I am exhausted. I am unhappy. I am pissed when I get home. This is not for me to do. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Totally. So talk about the capacity to maintain a business and wake up every day to it. Because you talked about your systems. The systems were perfect. Yeah. Right? Why I, could we repeat in many markets? Go ahead, Mike. Yeah. And I, and I was like, on that note, too, 
I've been around just long enough that I've seen people come up and be kind of like one hit wonders and disappear. You know, so I, when I first started flipping houses, it was 2018, you know, now in 2024, it's about six years I've been doing this. Um, we've, I've seen three market cycles, honestly, because we had kind of like the pre 2020 where stuff was pretty standard. And then we had the 2021, which was obviously insane where everything was going up everywhere and you could put a cardboard box on the corner and sell it for a hundred thousand dollars. Right. At to 2022 and 2023, where stuff was all of a sudden dead everywhere most part right um you know and and also too on that note the market that i'm in that i started in was one of the biggest rises and biggest falls during that whole process up in uh, eastern washington north idaho um and so i saw these people sort of come and go very very quickly and my i say would say sort of view about being like the best that i could be wasn't around having like necessarily the biggest or most profitable business it was around like how can you do it with the most consistency? Because that seemed to be the hard thing that nobody could figure out. It is. Mm -hmm. Again, another pearl of wisdom. The consistency is actually one of the harder things to figure out. And it, I find in mastermind programs, and you guys have one, mm -hmm. right? You have a program, which I want you to at least touch on for a minute called Scale, right? The Scale Community. That capacity to create a repeatable living model. One hit wonders. They, you know... They are doing really well in one market. They convince, you know, they have $5 million worth of money that they raise in an apartment building, but they've never done it before. Or, you know, they've been successful over here, but they haven't done that particular market. I have a really good example of something I invested in where somebody who is an investor in Los Angeles ended up going out to Arlington, Texas, and all of a sudden learned, you know, a $250,000 lesson, yeah. um, you know, which, Kind of like your plumbing, right? mm -hmm. a lot like the plumbing, like, oh, this is what happens when pipes freeze. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like that kind of lesson. Yeah. Um, but, um, but then how do you make it so that it is repeatable? And it always boils back down to systems. Mm -hmm. How do you make it repeatable is the systems, which is what you touched on earlier. So in scale, is that what you guys primarily teach is what do you find in actually being a mentor in a community like scale? Yeah. So our whole goal with their scale community is exactly how to help people scale businesses. Right. And so the people that, that we, we bring into that community, they're real estate educated. They understand like the basics of, you know, what a general deal looks like, like how to get hard money, you know, how to run basic comps, things like that. But they want to know how to build a system and team around it so that they can grow to make like legitimate money. Um, like our, a big tagline for our, our show, the Clicking Keys podcast is to learn to make massive income, not just passive income with your real estate business. Because like, I, I honestly argue that it is easier to make a million dollars than it is to replace like a high paying W2 with passive cash flow, especially these days with interest rates and everything else. Um, and so the, uh, the, the key that comes down to systems, building out staff and honestly knowing how to, I would say like, like measure and maintain those systems as they're going. Cause that's where a lot of people tend to get in trouble is they're, they have something that works and then the next month it doesn't work as well. So they change it. Right. But realistically, what you need to do is know how to measure things or actually be effective and make, and be patient enough to make small changes that don't like blow up your whole system because you're going off of what's worked in the past and expecting to work in the future. That's the only thing you can really do and learning to build the, the discipline and the kind of like, I would say the confidence to do that is 100% what separates people that I would say make a million dollars one year and then go bust the next versus people that are able to make a million dollars every single year consistently over and over and over again. Another pearl of wisdom, because it really is in the business model. I know mm -hmm. real estate itself, like I'm just, in my years, in my 35 years of investing, I have learned that real estate itself is a really great asset. It appreciates, it gives you cash flow, you've got tax shelter. Okay, great. I get the math of it, and that's really lovely. And you can participate in it in lots of different ways, which is lovely. So it makes it a very attractive field in being able to build a business, to grow money, to protect wealth, mm -hmm. right? And to pass wealth on. But then when you talk about what it takes to go from what you said tier two, which is, yeah, I've developed a portfolio that I'm relatively happy with. It gives me some freedom to, I really want to be able to use it as a career. I want to scale it. I want to expand it as a business model. I want to be, you know, the big guy on the block, or I want to be national, not regional. You know, that is that step. Mm -hmm. is based in business and it's no longer based in real estate. That's the step that's the most surprising to me. Whenever I see a syndication fail, 
it's always on the business model side. Mm -hmm. They're over leveraged. They're understaffed, right? They are well, it's almost always some version of that. Yeah. Over leveraged, understaffed. Because honestly, rarely it's that somebody actually stealing. Mm -hmm. I have seen some fails that are just people stealing. Mm -hmm. But the bulk of the fails I see are those two. Over leveraged, understaffed. Those are business those are business model problems. That's not a real estate problem. Yeah. I mean, and you know, the going back to like the um I'll take the direct to seller residential model, there's we have the same thing, right? Where the same two reasons that people tend to fail is they have poor lead flow, right? And they don't work their leads correctly. And so going back to, you know, over leveraged, understaffed, basically they haven't invested appropriately in the business or they have you know, don't have enough opportunity coming back to it and they don't, don't have the team or the efficiencies them, themselves to work on the leads that they're already getting. Um, and the easiest way to fix that is to increase your lead flow and to hire more staff to work your sales pipeline. Honestly, like it's not rocket science at all, but people try to make it more complicated because they, I don't know, they want to be special or they, they want to be the exception to the rule. Special, the exception to the rule, or they're just not willing to accept that there is a repeatable system. Yeah. And you know, I, I'm probably guilty of that myself that I, you know, accepting that there's a repeatable system. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess one of my questions I have is, you know, what is, you know, what in your history prepared you for your success today? And I, I just, the reason I want to ask that question is because I feel like that you've just described, you know, me, mindset, right? We talked about that at the beginning. Like, what, what's the purpose of this show is really teaching people about having the grit to do well in real investing in real estate. And that starts, starts and ends in mindset, mm -hmm. right? So what's in your history prepared you to be successful today? I suspect is something to do with your mindset, but also your education. I, mean, I think the edu you approach the world. Yeah, I think the education definitely helped a little bit because, you know, going through engineering, it forced me to learn how to learn. Right. Um, and even though engineering as a career now is very much like a glorified project manager going through school, like you have to learn how to understand pretty complex topics. Right. Um, and, and that that helped a lot. Besides that, like, it, it's funny, I had this conversation with my with my dad not too long ago. Um, and, you know, we were kind of talking about me going to school and, and I was saying like, I, I, I wish I kind of hadn't like gone into engineering and I kind of wasted five years and all sort of stuff. And my dad's like, he's like, but you didn't. He's like, because honestly, what you did is you spent five years learning what you didn't want your life to look like. And that's a great motivator to, you know, reframe the rest of your life. Um, and so that ultimately what set me up to be successful because I just have like a framework for exactly what I don't want mm -hmm. not not even just like the work day but like my flexibility of time my flexibility of travel my spending potential my future potential right all those things what i don't want them to be was what was going to be supported by the engineering career and so now i just know that everything i do is just like creating those other opportunities that i knew i wasn't going to have if i'd stayed that path well good on your dad i love that that he that he like accepted the higher purpose or the you know the greater good of like yeah, I paid for five years of college, but you learned what you didn't want to do. That was a good investment. I'm like, good yeah. job, dad. That's yeah. a good statement, right? But I think also um, one of the things that, you know, and, and uh, you know, learning how to learn and, and, but I would suggest if I may, I don't, I don't know you very well and I apologize if I'm getting in your business. All right. But I suggest if I may, since I work with people as a consultant on helping them understand their, their skills and their, their nature, right? What is it that they want to be doing in their time and in their day, right? And using real estate as a vehicle to their financial freedom, right? Your engineering mind is part of what makes you successful at running systems. Mm -hmm. Being a glorified project manager as an engineer has worked incredibly well when you're the one reaping all the benefits of managing your own projects. Because mm -hmm. I'm not a glorified project manager. I'm a psychology and teacher babe. Right? That's yeah. kind of where I go, as you can tell, like everything I've done in this conversation is to drive that direction, right? I don't run systems consistently well. I have to partner with people who run systems well. I have to partner with engineers mm -hmm. so that the systems work and that we thoughtfully and methodically change the systems based on observation and actual data that shows that it's working or not versus a feeling or an instinct. Yeah. So I'm just going to suggest, even though I don't know you very well, that your engineering mind is part of your success. Yeah, I would say it helped. But here's also the thing that's kind of funny is you're assuming I was a good engineer. 
Um, uh, no, I didn't say you were a good engineer. <laughs> yeah, but because because <laughs> okay. honestly, one of the one of the reasons I think I struggled in that career was sure. I wasn't I, I wasn't process oriented like that. Like engineers wanted, oh, okay, uh, like okay. they wanted you to be. Right. Um, okay. And I mean, in fact, in my first engineering job, I actually got in trouble because what I discovered I could do was I could just outsource my work to other engineers by asking them to do it and they would um and so i would basically just compile the results by asking other people and they're like well no we're there was a consultant coming like we're billing your time for this work and i was like but they already know how to do it why should you bill me for 10 hours to do that when they can do it in one and i just had like i recognize these efficiency issues and that's a big reason that that's one of the big things that turned me off from engineering in general and so what i've come to find honestly is is i, I never had the I would say the place to express this is where, where I strive is around helping people understand a vision and like get excited about building the vision, whether that's for our company, whether that's for their own company, their own mm -hmm. life. And that's why I like the scale community a lot yeah, is nice because, I yeah, I, I get a ton of value of like working directly with members in that. And all of a sudden you see the lights click on and they're just like, I just made more last week than I made on my W2 last year. I'm like, see, that's awesome. That's right. Awesome. You know, and then, and even people in our group, uh, in our group, in our, in our company, I'm purely like the visionary leader in that, in the way that like I set the direction of the ship and I help facilitate the little pieces that sort of like need to come together, but they do a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, and I can get people excited about that and like, you know, the future potential where things are going to go and you know, how we're all going to benefit from it and everything else. Um, but I didn't know that I sort of had that ability until I was in this position right because as an engineer i never would have discovered that um, all right so things that you do in your world yeah. is you have the keys podcast right collecting keys podcast mm -hmm. you have the scale community you also are a wholesaler and flipper so do you take private money in whole in your wholesaling flipping business uh occasionally yeah occasionally? okay yep. so not very often but sometimes um, cause who I'm leading to is, well, if people want to interact with you, they want to listen to your podcast, they want to become part of the scale community, or they want to support you in your business model. How do they do that? How do they get a hold of you? Yeah. So the best, best ways hit me directly, um, be either on Instagram for a social media person, it's at Mike underscore invests, um, or honestly email just Mike at collecting keys.com. And, uh, you know, I don't have like an assistant or anything. I monitor all those myself. So that will go straight to me. Beautiful. So thank you so much, Mike, for being on my show. So appreciate it. Uh, Mike D. Hahn. There you go. I got Good that job. right. I think I still yep. remembered it. Mike D. Hahn at collectingkeys.com podcast. Wonderful to have you on the show. If you can listen to this, we have a show once every two weeks on Spotify, iHeartRadio, iTunes, YouTube, Amazon. And we are no longer on Apple TV, but we are on Roku TV. So you can find this in lots of different platforms. Christina Suter with Real Estate Breakthrough. See you next show.